You can watch this video in 4K. It's this many pixels. We tend to think of old films, shows and clips as being so compressed and tiny that they're just impossible to watch on modern screens. But over time, the quality of the image got better and better. And here we are. Everyone knows what the 80s looked like. But wait, what's this? Incredibly clear footage of laborers in New York working on the Chrysler building in 1920s? Is that the First World War? Color images straight from Russian Empire? It looks really weird. Does that mean we could film in high res from like very start? So where did it all go wrong? Let's find out in our new feature Everyone was kind of a dumbass. Trust me, there is a story behind this title. It has history. The very first moving pictures were recorded on film stock, which was a very important thing during the 20th century. Let's take a look at what it was made of. Nitrocellulose, also known as gun cotton, was used as base for making smokeless powder used in firearms. That's right, just like so many other great inventions, its original purpose was to make killing other people easier. Nitrocellulose was developed from the needs of the limits of its predecessor – gunpowder or black powder. It fired slow, heavy bullets that had a short range. Even if you managed to hit your opponent somehow, after the first volley it was impossible to see where to shoot next, since everything was clouded by smoke. This led to the guns needed to be cleaned often. Nobody could even imagine an automatic weapon. Nitrocellulose was also used to patch up and dress wounds, as it could be made into collodion, a disinfectant surgical glue. So yeah, they basically used the same substance both to blow holes in people and to patch them up. Finally, nitrocellulose was used to produce nitrate-based film stock, which was used all the way up to the 1950s. And as you can imagine, it was super flammable, so before going to the cinema, you'd want to take time to locate the nearest fire exit. Actually, even an hour-long video might not be enough time to cover all the different ways nitrocellulose was used. But here's one interesting story. In 1869, John Wesley Hyatt came up with an idea of making billiard balls from nitrocellulose. He just wanted to win prize for saving elephants by finding substitute of ivory. Their tusks were used for this purpose at that time. His idea was the bomb. Quite literally, as the balls would explode when they hit each other with enough strength. But let's go back to film. Interestingly, film itself does not have a resolution. It is coated with transparent emulsion of super tiny, light sensitive silver halide crystals, which turn dark when light hits them. Thus, whatever is lighter in real life looks darker on film. This is how we get a negative image. And that is the underlying principle of how black and white film works. Colored film works based on the same principle. But there are several layers with different colors. You can think of these crystals as pixels, the difference being that a pixel has a fixed position on the screen, while crystals are located randomly throughout this gelatinous goo. I don't want to give any photographers an uncomfortable erection, but that's where the grain comes from. Actually, counting the number of grains, I mean, crystals is virtually impossible. What we can do, though, is try to determine the smallest objects that can be photographed using film. For example, how many lines can be fit in one millimeter of tape and then discerned in the image. Then you can go all in and try to convert that into approximate resolution in pixels. Or you can just ask Eastman Kodak. It's something close to modern 6K. And that's just ordinary film stock used for making movies, doing fashion photography, all that kind of stuff. But, as we know, any new technology can be used to make killing people easier, right? I'm not talking about nitrocellulose being flammable enough to set the whole building on fire. No. 
I'm talking about the military being the most interested and involved party in the development of field technology. Reconnaissance, the gathering of information about your potential opponent, is a very important aspect of military strategy. With the invention of the airplane, it reached new heights, and photo cameras gained new value. Because without a camera, you have to follow your enemy for a long time, counting, writing down, trying to remember, or even drawing the positions, numbers of their fortifications people, horses, but with a camera you can simply take a picture and go home. The military quickly launched a definition race aimed at making images sharper with more details and contrast, and Kodak were the ones to produce film stock both for military and civilian purposes, which meant that ordinary people could enjoy the improved quality as well. A cool example of just how good and sharp those images were can be seen in pictures taken by a US spy satellite called Keyhole. And this is KH-9 Hexagon, a satellite size of a bus weighing 12 tons. The gigantic camera on board was able to photograph objects half a meter long from several hundred kilometers away. So now you have great cameras. Amazing quality film stock. You took some awesome pictures. What's next? Now you have to find a way to deliver them back to Earth. I mean, your picture is just the result of emotion reacting to light. It is a physical thing. So this enormous piece of film was rolled up tightly, put in special spherical capsules, so-called photo buckets and then dropped with a parachute somewhere above the ocean, where a special plane then fished it out with a hook. Just to summarize, almost every movie ever shot on film was shot in the resolution of more than 4K or higher. But then something went wrong, and we took a step backwards. Well, actually, there was no other way. First, TV came along. It became a serious competitor for movies, as you could watch it regularly from the comfort of your own coach at home, and it showed not only movies, but also news and sports. And that tiny black and white screen was, well, a reasonable compromise for such a variety of entertainment. Filming for TV was different. Everything had to be larger and simpler. Makes sense, as you need to be able to tell faces apart on a very small screen. Fun fact, footballs, some of you call them soccer balls, became black and white because of TV. The high contrast pattern we know today could actually be seen during matches aired on TV, unlike the controversial brown. This is the official ball of the 1968 European Championship. It was called Telstar, after this satellite. Makes sense to me. Some movies and TV series were still shot on film, but they used a much cheaper type. Because what's the point if everyone is watching on, well, this? Most TV programs soon came to be recorded using fully analog TV cameras. And that's the footage that we remember when we think of 60s and 90s, and probably it was re-recorded multiple times. And don't even get me started on VHS. It had the benefit of allowing everyone to watch whatever they want, whenever they want. And because of how available it was, it's a window into the 80s. Old recordings, amateur movies, TV programs. But the lower cost has its price. The quality was way below average. Then digital came along. Digital cameras, digital videos. The whole quest for good quality had to start from scratch. We had to learn how to crawl all over again. The entire evolution of film and video suddenly did not matter anymore. Lots of things that were recorded a long time ago look just fine. Most of them do, actually. The value of this footage cannot be overestimated. I recently watched a TV series about World War I. Colorized. To be honest, it left me with a strange feeling. The color was there. I mean, in real life. 
But the cameras didn't pick it up, so there was no trace of it on film. Everything had to be carefully added in by artists. This isn't restoration, it's improvement. CGI, special effects, this kind of stuff. Even though all the colors were chosen to correspond with real historic objects. Neural networks, on the other hand, can restore the details of the past pretty objectively. In order to teach machine to upscale old videos, we first take video originally shot in good quality and then intentionally compress it, adding some noise and artifacts to the picture. Then we show both versions to the system and say, hey, make this crappy video look the same as the good one. Important details are intentionally removed so that the machine learns how to recreate it from nearly nothing. It uses a gun, which is basically two neural networks working together. The first one tries to improve the image, the second one checks the result and determines if the picture is pleasing to the eye. But neither of them actually understand what pleasing to the eye even means. But in fact, when we think about the final result, neural network should work the way our brain does. Stick with me on this one. If you've ever played the games of the 90s, you'll get what I mean. We don't see much detail, but our imagination adds it in, finishing the picture, polishing it up. In the same way our brain immerses you into a two-dimensional world, it adjusts the poor quality of the video. It fills in the missing pieces and details, imagining how it would look like in reality. We are pretty good at that, because we can read those details. We understand that this hardly recognizable line must be a wrinkle and we teach neural network to recreate it the same way. In a sense, we teach it to understand the image the same way we do. A good neural network should be able to look at just a few darkened grains of silver in the film and figure out what they really are. Figure out that this blurred shape is a curl of hair and this line is the fold on a coat. These are the images that it needs to recreate. So if anyone ever tells you that old videos were recorded in low resolution, don't get mad, everyone was kind of a dumbass.